The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Do you need the mic? Do you need this mic? No. Okay. No. You just yeah. Good morning, everyone. We're going to have uh, Seth talk with us today about the work that he's done on Chef, which is or Champ, I believe it is, mm -hmm. and works with Django, which I got that one right, and uh, give you a good idea of what it is how it's going to work. He's one of the chief uh, code writers for it, so ask him any questions you got. Thank you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay on the mic? I just want to make sure. Yes? Okay. Um, all right, so my name's Seth Chismore. Um, I'm going to be talking today about deploying fully automated, highly available Django application stacks with Chef. Uh, mainly using that as sort of a model to talk about Chef and some of the features it has and just talk about some of the benefits it can use when you're deploying things like Django or really any other web application stack. So first, talk a little about who I am. Uh, like I said, my name's Seth Chismore. I'm a senior technical consultant and evangelist with OpsCode Inc. Um, I'm also the project lead for many of the OpsCode sponsored open source projects, including the OpsCode Cookbook Repository, uh, the Knife Cloud Provisioning Plugins, which are Knife EC2, Knife Rackspace, and Knife OpenStack and also the Knife Windows plugin, which probably here you guys can hiss at me a little bit, but uh, which is used for interacting with Windows nodes um, and also provisioning Windows nodes. But the cool thing is you do that all from your regular nice Unix environment, so you don't have to be on a Windows box. So it's really nice for uh, admins in a mixed, mixed environment where they have Windows and Linux nodes to uh, manage. So I don't know, like talk a little bit about who you guys are today. Is, do we have any system administrators here today? Okay, um, developers? And then I guess everyone else is business people. That's what we'll assume. So, um, and probably a lot of us are a mix of all these things. I mean, nowadays with the whole DevOps movement, everything going on, I think we uh, move back and forth between all these categories quite uh, regularly. So today, what are we going to be talking about? Um, we're going to talk about the hows and whys of managing infrastructure with Chef, a quick overview of Chef, which we'll call the Chef 101. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about deploying an interior Django app application stack with Chef. And then we'll also we'll finish up with leveraging ways that you can leverage the same chef code to actually deploy different configurations of that stack. So sort of like write once and you can you know, run your code in many different stacks. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so sort of the hows and whys and where we're going to start with this, the first thing this all has to do with is infrastructure as code. And this is the first, like, the technical definition, the technical domain revolving around building and managing infrastructure programmatically. But at its heart, I think this definition's better. Um, really what we're trying to do is enable the reconstruction of the business from nothing but a source code repo, an application data backup, and bare metal resources. So this is the dream. If you can get to this point, the idea being that you can rebuild your infrastructure from scratch in, in case disaster happens, um, and it'll help you when you know, everybody's, second, everybody's favorite second girlfriend, Nagios, uh, wakes you in the middle of the night and you're ready for the worst case scenario if you had to rebuild everything from scratch. So. There's, there's a few parts to this. First, configuration management. Um, and configuration management is really talking about keeping track of all the steps required to take bare metal systems uh, and get them up and doing their job in the infrastructure. So this doesn't have to be fancy and fully automated. Uh, at the lowest end of this, it can be a wiki page and the meet cloud, aka a sysadmin inputting things. But that is configuration management. It's documented how to rebuild a server if you had to. Uh, we're hopefully aiming for something a little more fully automated, uh, like Chef. And when we talk about configuration management, we're usually talking about in the context of a single server, so building a single server and getting it up and running. So as we start to get into the next step of things, we start to talk about systems integration. Uh, with regard to Chef, this is actually talking about fully automated infrastructure, and it's actually taking all those different nodes that you might have brought up and actually making them talk together and interact with each other. 
So that's sort of the next step in things. So just because you can configure a single server, it gets more interesting when you actually have to configure, configure a bunch of servers to talk to each other. Uh, so let's get into a little quick intro about Chef. How many of you have heard about Chef or use Chef at all? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so Chef's got a couple different parts to it. Uh, we'll go through each of those. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the Chef framework. So Chef, the project, provides a framework for fully automated infrastructure and it has some in, in, uh, important design principles. Uh, it's idempotent, so I'm gonna go into each of these in a little more detail and we'll talk about them uh, and break them out each individually, so that's just the first principle. Uh, it's made up of libraries and primitives. It's flexible. It's reasonable. And uh, not, this is a Perl term, but a Tim Toady. Basically, there's more than one way to do things. So we believe that you know your infrastructure best and you should be able to switch up how you do things. So Chef should be flexible. So when we talk about idempotence, we're actually talking about multiple applications of an operation do not change the result. So in the context of Chef, what this means is you can run the Chef client on a node over and over and over again. And the things that it's configuring, once they get to the state they should be in, install a package, it's not gonna attempt to reinstall those things. Um, so once it gets to the state that you sort of modeled and said it should be at this state, you can just keep running the Chef client over and over again and things won't change on a server or a node. Um, so Chef also believes in providing you primitives. We don't try to model the world, uh, mostly because every infrastructure is different and you know your infrastructure best. So we're not gonna give you a configuration management tool that says this is the way you should set up your servers, this is the way it should be done. We're gonna provide you primitives that allow you to model that and, and, and that way people can actually model their infrastructure as they see fit. Uh, so from Chef's perspective, you know, the tool should do pretty much what you expect. So there should be sane defaults, but you need to have those override points when you need them. You need to be able to change things. So out of the box, you're gonna get something that's not gonna blow up in your face and it's gonna work. But if you see a need to change things and scale things differently or tweak things, you have the, the, uh, the pivots to do that. And sort of tying into that, uh, you know, there's more than one way to do it. So Chef is a very flexible framework. Uh, you can do pretty much anything you want. And just like Perl doesn't tell programmers how to program, Chef doesn't tell sysadmins how to manage a system. So you can extend it, mold it, modify it, and do what you need with it. And since it's written in Ruby, and Ruby's uh, the main language for most of it, uh, it's very powerful and you can hook into other things within Ruby and take advantage of the Ruby that's in there. Um, so that's sort of the overview of the, the whole framework, but the actual chef tools, the things that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a, there's a few of those and let's go over those real quick. So OHI is the actual uh, tool that runs on a node and gathers metadata about that, things like IP address, memory usage, all those different things, and it's very similar to Factor, which is in Puppet. Um, so that's the first piece of it. The chef client, uh, that's the actual thing that runs on your nodes and, and configures them. So when the chef client runs, it actually runs OHI to collect all that metadata, and then it actually executes things in recipes and cookbooks, which we'll get into in a little bit here. But that's the actual sort of I guess binary that you run out on your nodes on a regular basis, and, and it's the core of Chef. Um, knife is the command line interface, or the actual tool that as a sysadmin or a Chef user, you will actually use that to manage your infrastructure. So most of your interactions with Chef and, and working with nodes and that are done through Knife. And then uh, Chef with an S, which is a terrible name and it confuses people all the time, but Shell Chef, is uh, an interactive debugger console or that you can basically jump in and, and start running commands in, inside of with your Chef infrastructure. So it's really useful when you're debugging things. So those are the core tools in Chef, but there's an actual API of Chef and sort of architecture, and we'll talk about that a little bit now. Um, so first, Chef believes in a fat client and a thin server, and I'll try to explain what this means a little. All actual code in Chef is eval evaluated down on the nodes so the actual server that's involved here is very thin and it's really just an API REST server and a file server where it distributes the cookbooks out to nodes. So that allows Chef to scale very easily since the server's so thin um, and most work is done out on the, on the actual nodes. Um, the API that the client and server interact with is RESTful uh, and the payloads are JSON. So, you know, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, there's a built-in search service, and that's one of the most powerful features built into Chef, so, and we'll, we'll get into examples of that, especially when we talk about the Django application pieces, but it allows you to actually, in the context of a recipe in your code, 
make a search for other components in your infrastructure and use the metadata indexed about those components to do other configuration tasks. So a really simple example is you've got an application server and you need to write out your database config. Um, you could actually do a search, grab a reference to the database master, and then write out that configuration using the IP address and all the things in that environment. So you don't have to do any hard coding. Another great example is uh, the context of a load balancer. The load balancer can actually make a search and find out all the nodes it's supposed to be balancing based on some type of role name or some other attribute, and then automatically write out its configuration and keep up to date. So it's a really powerful feature of Chef. Uh, and then derivative services. So since Chef exposes a REST API, you can easily mash it up with other pieces of your infrastructure. Um, so we've got integrations with things like Rundeck, which is an uh, orchestration tool. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of people writing other things out there just because the API is well documented and easy to use and it's just REST. So, so Chef's also an open source project and there's a large community behind it. Um, it's Apache licensed uh, version two. Um, there's about 360 plus individual contributors at this time. Uh, about 70 plus corporate contributors including Dell, Rackspace, VMware, RightScale, Heroku, and, and numerous others. Um, We've got about 240 plus cookbooks out on the community site. Um, and one of the most powerful things about Chef is, you're, we're gonna dive in and talk about cookbooks a little, but you can sort of write these cookbooks and, and they represent configuring a certain thing in your infrastructure, but they also could represent the same thing in other people's infrastructure. So you're able to take that code, uh, tar it up and share it with the community and then everyone else is able to build on top of that. So not, not only is the core Chef a really neat uh, open source project, but the actual cookbooks that, that sysadmins are using out there is really interesting and people are sharing those left and right. Um, and those are all shared on community.opscode.com, uh, which the way to think about that, it's sort of like CPAN or RubyGems or you know, any of those different th package management things for different uh, languages. So. We talked about the Chef client a little bit. The Chef client runs on your systems. Uh, it talks to a Chef server. Uh, and you, know, you can either install your own Chef server and maintain that, or there are hosted Chef servers. Opscode provides one. Uh, right now, it's been being called the Opscode platform, but we're rebranding. It's going to be called Hosted Chef. You'll probably hear about that this week. But that allows you to basically just leverage a, a SaaS Chef, Chef server and not have to maintain that yourself. So. Um, the clients authenticate with RS key, RSA keys. Uh, the client holds the private key and the server holds the public key. So the server is not a centralized store of the authentication information and it pushes out that responsibility to the node. So the first time a client or a node checks in with the chef server, it gets a unique key pair generated for it and the, and the private key is sent down to the node and at that point that's where it lives. And then all other authentication takes over with that key pair you know, from there forward. Um, each system, that you each system that you configure, we call it a node or a managed node. And nodes have attributes. So this is some example output of what OHI returns on like my MacBook. And you can see some of the information that came back. We've got kernel information, you know, a platform version, the platform it's running on, uh, an IP address, a host name, you know, and there's tons of this. And OHI actually has a really uh, extensible plugin system. So if there's data that OHI isn't returning, for your platform, you can actually write custom plugins to actually return uh, more information. Some people do this for, they have a plugin for their data centers to return very specific information about the data center, uh, and maybe call out to a local API server to even pull in more information. Um, so it's, it's pretty neat. And all that data is JSON. So OHI returns JSON, and then that, J, that data is sent up to the Chef server and indexed. Uh, and then, you know, now that we're collecting all this metadata, we can actually make searches uh, based on that. So you can see this is two different examples of the same search. That first one is actually using the knife CLI tool I talked about. So this might be that you just want to do some type of inventory work and try to figure out, all right, give me a list of all the nodes in my environment that are running uh, OS 10 that Chef manages. And you'd get back a list of that data. Um, the same exact search query, this is what you would do inside of a recipe. And we're going to look at it, some example code of that. But you can see we're searching it into the node index and we want to get a list of all nodes that are running OS 10. So, um, it's pretty simple syntax and very powerful. So Chef enables infrastructure as code in a different way. So um, we're going to, again, dive into each of these things individually. Uh, we manage our system configuration as resources. We put those resources together into recipes. Uh, we distribute recipes as cookbooks. And we actually assign recipes to individual systems through roles. And then we also have an arbitrary 
uh, storage area called a data bag that we can put uh, different information about our infrastructure, and we'll look at some examples of that. And then the big thing we want to do here is track all of this like source code. So we're going to be saving our actual configurations up into like a Git repo or SVN or somewhere. That way we can, again, rebuild from scratch if we ever had to. We can collaborate with multiple people on, with a, multiple people on our team. But again, it, it's source code, and we want to check it into a repo in the end. Um, so first thing, Chef manages resources as node, or uh, man, manages resources on nodes. Um, so all resources have a type. And you can see we highlighted a couple different resources here. We've got a package resource, template resource, and a service resource. And what we're doing in this little set of uh, three resources is installing and configuring HA proxy. Uh, so you can see at the top, we actually do a package, you know, install the package, template, and service, and dive into more of this. Uh, they have a name. So in some cases, usually the name, like on the package resource, it's the actual name of the package you're installing. In the template resource, it's the, the path to the final file that we're going to render. And in this case, the service resource is the name of the service that we're going to manage. So they have parameters. Um, you can see we've highlighted different things. Uh, in the service one, we're telling that that particular service supports a restart. Uh, in the template one, you guys might see some things you recognize. We've got an owner and group for the final file and uh, you know, what mode it's going to be in. So in this case, 644. Uh, and the source one up there is actually the template that we're going to render. So the actual templates in Chef are, are ERB, which if you've done any Ruby, that's a templating language. So it allows you to inter interject dynamic values in the context of that config file, and then we render that out on disk. And you'll see some examples of that in a minute. Um, and we take action to put resources into a declared state. So every resource you see is going to have an action associated with it. So in the case of a package, we're going to install it. We might, another action you could do with that is upgrade. You could also do remove. Um, on the service, we're going to enable it and we're going to start it to ensure it's running. Uh, in the template, we don't actually, there are, every resource actually has a default too, and in this case, the default is to create it. So we didn't have to actually spell that out, but. And resources actually, oops, uh, and we can also send notifications to other resources. So in this case, you can see when we make a change to the Apache or HA proxy configuration, we would actually want to notify the HA proxy service that it needs to restart so it picks up those new changes. So, and resources actually take action through providers. So we have multiple providers per resource type. And a great example is the package resource. We have providers for apt, yum, ruby gems, portage, mac ports, freebsd ports, and really anything else anybody wanted to implement if there's another package manager out there. So, uh, if you're a developer, you can sort of think of the, the resource as the interface and the actual provider as the implementation. So just like, you know, if you're programming Java or something, you could have multiple implementations for an interface. It's the same idea. Uh, and the providers are the actual thing that takes action out on the system. So we talked about how, like, a recipe, or uh, we talked about the individual resources, and now you saw some code there that was sort of a recipe. So recipes are just collections of these resources. Um, Recipes are evaluated in the order they appear. So it's pretty simple as you're writing your code. You know, it's going to happen just like normal code when you're writing any other language. You know, the package is going to be installed first, the template's going to be rendered, and then the service is going to be enabled and started. So each resource object is added to the resource collection at runtime, and that's how Chef actually does the work of evaluating what it should do. Um, recipes can include other recipes. So, you might have, this actually I think was lifted from the Nagios cookbook, but uh, in order for the Nagios web UI to run, you would need to make sure Apache's installed and some modules are enabled. So that's an example of, you don't have to copy and paste, you just go ahead and make a reference to the other uh, cookbook and recipes that you want to use. So one thing that's really neat about Chef Recipes, they are pure Ruby. Um, you know, there's a nice DSL you can use, but when you feel you want to drop into Ruby to make things a little easier, it's completely encouraged and you should do it. So in this particular case, what we're doing, we could have written out uh, two package resources if we wanted to, to do this, and to install Python and Python dev packages. But in this case, we can also just put it into a loop. Uh, percent %w is a Rubyism that basically makes that into an array. Uh, all the items in the array are terminated by white space inside those brackets. So what we're saying here is, for each of the items in that array, we want to do a package install. So you can see how that's sort of simplified uh, the code. 
Um, we can also do dynamic configuration through search. So this is the first time you guys are seeing an example of using the search uh, syntax. So in this case, we're going to create the HA proxies configuration, and we're actually getting a list of pool members by making a search out to the node index and grabbing every node that has a role of Django CMS. So we're assuming that's our, the role we apply to our application server. Um, and that'll give us a list of, or an array of all the pool members. We're able to take those pool members then and actually send them into the template. Uh, and that template knows how to work with that array and loop over them and write out configuration values for each of those things. So it doesn't matter if you know, one item's returned from that, 10 item, or 100 items are returned from that. Um, the idea being it's very dynamic at this point, and you don't have to rewrite this code as you add more app servers into the balancing pool. So cookbooks are packages for recipes. And just like packages in any other packaging system, they have dependencies. So when you're creating your cookbook, if you have to use the Apache 2 cookbook for your particular cookbook, you would just put a, an explicit dependency on those. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice, and it makes code uh, very reasonable. And they're easy to share. As we talked about before, community.opscode.com is the spot to go share those. And they're just, that's just like PyPy, RubyGems.org, or CPAN. Um, so we talked about the recipes, the cookbooks. Now, roles are the actual thing that describe a node. So you can see in this particular case, we're actually looking at two separate role files here. Um, the first one is for the Django CMS app server for a particular app server. Uh, they both have a description of what they're going to do. The bottom one is the Django CMS load balancer. Um, and roles have a run list. So in the top one, which is our app server, we're going to install the MySQL client. Uh, and then we're going to run a recipe that um, actually sets up the application server. And we're going to get into the details of that in a little bit. Um, the bottom one, you can see all it's in its run list is HA proxy and the recipe's app load balancer. So that's basically just going to install HA proxy and do that search that we talked about. And roles can also have attributes. Uh, and this is sort of where we start to get into some of the override points I talked about, how you can override same defaults. So in this particular case, we're telling Chef which role we want to perform the search with. So that'll, that'll ensure that the actual search to look for um, app servers to load balance is Django CMS. So, so the last thing we talked about is data bags. And data bags are really just a, a arbitrary place to store data, sort of like a large NoSQL store. This is a little smaller than I want it to be. But in this particular case, I'm just dumping out to show you what kind of data might be in there. So this is the actual data bag item for our application that we're going to be deploying. You can see some of the data that's stored up in there. We've got a bunch of the database information about uh, the password for the database and the name of the database, the username that you connect with, uh, where do we want to deploy code to out on the server, where do we actually pull code from, um, what kind of native packages do we need to install, uh, what, what Django pack or uh, Python packages do we need to install. So you can see this is, and this is just free form data, depending on your application or your needs, you can put anything in there. Uh, you might want to put you know, IP information. There's, a, there's just a lot of different information depending on your infrastructure that you might want to throw in a data bag. And then finally, we want to track all of this like source code, which we talked about before. So this is just showing the Git log from one of our projects, the cookbook repo. And you can see some of this stuff. You know, we just start checking it in, right into Git, like everything else. So. The stack we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to be talking about an interior stack that's using Django, Django CMS, and uh, Green Unicorn, which is uh, one of the newer ways to deploy Django applications. So there's a couple different steps we've got to discuss here. The first thing we have to do is actually provision our servers. Um, we need some computers on the internet. They're going to end up being load balancers, web servers, and database servers. And we need to launch these. Now, we could launch these through something like you know, kickstart or something. Um, in our case, we're going to chat a little bit about just launching with a cloud API. But the idea being you just have bare metal running somewhere, nothing else configured, just a base OS install. After you do that, we actually have to configure these servers to do something. Um, so we want to install packages, create users. Uh, you could use pre-built images for this. But just for a simple infrastructure, uh, you know, you'd have four discrete images to maintain and keep maintaining. So we actually would rather do this using something like Chef to do the configuration. And the last mile of all this is we've got to actually integrate these. So 
the systems are configured, but we also need to configure them to talk to each other. So just because we brought up a load balancer or just because we brought up an app server, we've got to draw those final lines and actually connect it all together. So that's sort of the stack we're going to be talking about, the final look of it. Um, so Chef enables systems integration. That, that's a really important thing that Chef does that some other configuration management tools don't do. Uh, Chef searches allow nodes to be aware of each other and self-configure. Uh, a shared application ba data bag, which we looked at before, allows many application servers to check out the same application code during their initial bootstrapping. So what we want to be able to do is actually provision a server, bootstrap that server, and by the end of that first initial provision bootstrap, the app should be up and running on that server. And that should take like minutes versus hours. And the app server and database servers will also initialize off the same database config. And you'll see what we mean by that when we actually look at the individual servers. So the first item we're talking about, uh, we'll bring up first is our database master. Um, take a look at the role we're going to apply to that. So again, this is just if I was to use knife and, and run this command, this is the output of that. Uh, the main thing we want to look at here is the run list. So all of this uh, node has in its run list is database master. So it's the database cookbook and the master recipe within that cookbook. Um, the database master recipe reads the application information from that data bag I showed you guys earlier, and it uses it to create the database so the application can store its data. So at a high level, what it's doing, we're going to install configure MySQL. We're going to create an application database. We're going to grant the application user access to that database. And that's all going to happen 100% automated. We're not going to have to get involved and type any SQL commands or do anything out on the actual server. Um, the actual Django application servers, we're going to have one to end of these. You know, you at least obviously have to have one, but we can keep adding more if we had to. And when we Adding more is just provisioning more of those. So if we needed like three of them, we just go ahead and provision three of them. If we need a fourth then, we could provision one more. Um, so we're basically scaling horizontal with this. Um, and we can even scale up and down based on demands. So uh, there's a lot of people out there using Chef that they, this layer, they actually change based on certain outside inputs. And they take advantage of the Chef APIs to actually know when they need to add more servers or, or take down servers. Uh, the actual role for this particular uh, node, you can see we looked at this a little bit earlier, but we, we're going to install the MySQL client recipe, which ensures the MySQL client libraries are there. And then we're also going to use the application recipe. Um, the main one here that's doing the heavy lifting is the application recipe. And this recipe reads data from the data bag that we looked at before. Uh, it determines what type of application it needs to deploy, the repository where it should grab the code, uh, the details on where to put it, and what roles to search to find the actual database master to make the connection. And then it renders um, its configuration file out. So on this particular server, we've got a couple important steps. In the context of talking about an app server, we need to actually deploy the application code and get it on the system. So in this case, our example, we're going to check out code from Git. Uh, we need to install any required packages. These might be OS packages or Python, so it might be native packages. Uh, say we were using uh, image magics or something, you know, inside of our in our Python. We'd have to ensure that those native packages are installed. Uh, we're going to create an environment specific config file. So this actual file is the thing that's going to have the database connection information. And the neat thing about this is it's dynamic. It's created on the fly based on the environment where the app server is running. So we don't have to actually hard code anything in those files or check those into source control or anything like that. And so when we deploy it in multiple different environments, that file just is rendered based on the local environment. And after you've deployed your code and actually gotten on the system, we actually have to do something, put something on there to serve it up. So in our particular case, we're going to install GUnicorn. You could also do something like Apache 2 mod WSGI. Um, but that's the actual thing that's going to serve up the code. And then we're going to create an app application specific config file, or if it's Apache, like a vhost, basically. <laughs> So the real magic on this, though, if you were to look at the recipe code, is this search. Um, it looks very similar to the search we looked at before for a load balancer, but really what we're doing is we're searching against the node index. Uh, we're looking for anything that has a role of Django CMS database master. Um, and those results we're actually going to use to render out the local settings PI file. So that's just within the Django community, there's not really a standard uh, 
settings file, sort of like in Rails, if you guys have done that, there's a database YAML. Uh, so in this one, we're going to render out local settings.py, and that'll get picked up by the application uh, and override the database settings so it connects to the right database. Um, and so now that we've got our database master built out, we've got uh, a couple app servers, we're actually going to need to install and configure the load balancer. So we looked at this role a little bit before, nothing too exciting here. Um, Basically, we're overriding some attributes. While we're looking for all, app, all nodes with a role of Django CMS, and our run list is just HA proxy app load balancer. So, and the big thing here is we want the balancing pool to grow as more application servers are brought online. And very simple search syntax here. We're going to search for all nodes that have a role of Django CMS. Again, this would have been sent in dynamically, though, from the override. Um, and all those pool members are going to be sent in to actually render the HA proxy config file. So this search actually occurs every time Chef runs on the load balancer on that node. So as you add more app servers to the mix, the load balancer will automatically become aware of them. So I mean, that's a pretty, pretty powerful thing. It's a very simple thing. All you have to do is daemonize Chef Client to run on those load balancers, and you can set that to any time period you want. It could be five minutes, it could be 30 minutes. You know, it's up to you based on your needs and your infrastructure. So, you know, now that we've, we've got and looked at everything, what's really interesting about the code we just walked through or that sort of architecture we're talking about, we can actually use a single set of chef cookbooks, roles, and data bags to deploy our application stacks in a bunch of different ways. So let's talk a little bit how we can deploy that and why this is interesting. Uh, we can take those and actually provision a node with all those roles applied and actually put everything on a single node. So you know, we were looking at the case where we want to break apart everything into individual nodes and actually have a load balancer, two app servers, and a database master. There's no reason that we couldn't have uh, provision a node with a run list that had all of those roles on it and actually had everything running on a single box. And that's really interesting for doing things like QA uh, or staging boxes or even development. Um, we could use the same code to provision things on physical hardware or any number of public or uh, private cloud providers. So most of your chef code is going to be able to run on any different uh, hardware running anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's, it's public, private, cloud, or physical. And we'll look at some of the commands you do to provision things a little differently. Um, and the last thing that's really interesting is we can take that same run list and provision uh, a developer workstation with a fully virtualized Vagrant and VirtualBox setup for doing their testing uh, and, and debugging. So. so I'm going to show you. These are actually three different commands to launch things on, on three different sort of like, I guess, uh, hardware setups. So the first one, we could use that to actually launch our stack in a data center. Um, assuming that a box had been provisioned ahead of time using something like Cobbler, Kickstarter, whatever, with an IP address of 123.12333, just in this example. And you can see the big thing we're doing here is passing in the run list with a dash R. So right there, we're actually going to install the database master. Um, make it an app server by using the Django CMS role, and then also make it in a load balancer. So conversely, we can take this exact same command and using nice built-in uh, cloud provisioning uh, stuff with the knife EC2 plugin, we could actually create and provision a server out in EC2 and then apply the same run list, and it would do the exact same steps that you, you know, we were doing in the first one. And then to do it with Rackspace, it's just a matter of switching out you know, knife Rackspace server create. So, we didn't actually have to change any of the code that we wrote for Chef or any of that configuration code. It's all the same code. It's just that we've chosen to provision things in three different ways. So you can see that it makes it very portable across cloud providers or even across your data center out to a cloud. Um, so if we wanted to make this a multi-machine cluster out in EC2, you can see that all we have to do is just provision four different nodes and break those roles apart. Uh, versus stacking them on a single node, that would do the same thing. But we'd have that setup we talked about where we had uh, you know, the interior architecture where everything split apart. So it's really just a matter of how you provision things uh, that makes the difference. And then finally, if anyone's heard about Vagrant, um, Vagrant's basically uh, a Ruby gem that makes a nice wrapper around VirtualBox and allows you to automate bringing up uh, and breaking down VirtualBox uh, VMs. So it's almost like making VirtualBox feel like a cloud 
because you can easily provision things and, br and, and bring them down programmatically quickly. So Vagrant's a project that's actually been written. It allows you to actually write this nice little configuration file out. And the big thing you're gonna see here is we're, we're specifying the run list in our Vagrant file. Exact same run list we saw before that we were stacking. Um, and then all you have to type is Vagrant up and that would basically do all the work under the covers to talk to VirtualBox, bring it up running on your local machine. Yeah, go ahead. Um, usually the way it works with virtual boxes, you have boxes, so you've got a base, just like you have sort of base AMI and EC2 or something. So, uh, and there's actually a tool called VWE that allows you to build those. Uh, it's got a really high level language to allow you to sort of define, this is the OS that should be installed, here's some base things that should be in the image. Um, so that's a neat project. So once you build those boxes though, you just share them like you would an AMI or something else. Um, but that's really, really neat for if you're like in a web development shop and what happens in, the, in a development shop like that a lot is you get developers who are running things on their local MacBook and they go to throw the things out in production that's CentOS or Ubuntu or something and stuff breaks. So this is a way that they can actually bring up the production environment locally, test their changes, um, and you, you'll get a lot less of that finger pointing or that, hey, it worked on my machine, I don't know why it's not working in production. So, so as a bonus, we're gonna talk a little about, we just talked about doing this all with a Django application stack. Um, so the application cookbook, which it's, you know, we're not gonna dive into it today, but, but at a high level, it allows you to deploy the following web stack. So you can deploy Django, Java web apps, PHP, Rails, and we're gonna be adding Node.js soon. Um, and so that one cookbook has this pattern of deploy the code, uh, get the server component running, configure it, right? That thing we talked about at a high level, you could insert, and all that stuff we just talked about, you could insert in these other technologies and do the exact same thing. Um, we've also got some quick starts that OpsCode wrote, and I'll make sure that I, uh, when I post these slides, I'll make sure there's links to those. But if you go out to our blog and just search for quick starts, you'll find them pretty quickly. Um, and they actually walk you through, hand holding you through the steps to do exactly what I just talked about. So it's really nice. You, you could know nothing about Chef and be up and running. Uh, with your favorite web stack and see how to deploy it and run with it. So, so you know, there's some further resources. Um, you can go out to our website, opscode.com. The open source project's out on wiki.opscode.com. Um, you know, if you're ever searching for anything on Twitter, pound op chef is the actual, our hashtag for chef. So if you're ever working on anything, chef, definitely search through that. Um, we're always out on irc.freenode.net in the pound chef and chef hacking. So chef's more if you're a chef user, hacking's for more of the dev team working on the core chef project. Uh, and then there's mailing lists available at list.opscode.com. So does anybody have any questions or? Yeah, go ahead. How's the support, uh, I work in Java shop. Okay. Um, so WebLogic and WebSphere have some interesting stuff because they're semi-proprietary obviously. Uh, we do have some proprietary cookbooks we've written. There's nothing stopping you from writing a cookbook to deploy WebSphere. Um, it just, you'd have to figure out if, if it's got a GUI installer, if there's a way to automate that. Um, that can be a difficult. You know, right now we do have support for Tomcat and Jetty, um, but there's nothing stopping you from writing a cookbook to, to automate installation of, you know, WebSphere. Okay. So, and we do have some proprietary cookbooks we've written with partners, so like Splunk, we've got a cookbook we're writing with them that deals with license management and all that kind of stuff to deploy Splunk and get it running, so. Okay. Um, so, can you go? That's okay. So as far as installing Chef in the context of your workstation to run Knife or out on a node or? As a server. As a server, okay. Um, yeah, the Chef, I'm not, I don't know the server that well to be completely honest with you. I actually know the client side stuff very well. Um, I've written a lot of the Knife, helped write a lot of the Knife stuff and the actual Chef client stuff, but the server, the server can be a complicated beast because it's running Rabbit, Solar. I mean, it's got a lot of CouchDB. Um, you know, one thing that if you're just getting started with Chef, you might look into just going out and messing with the platform, because uh, I didn't mention that, but we, you know, the base account, the free account, lets you have up to five nodes for free. 
So it basically means you can manage five servers with, the, with our Chef server. And sometimes that's a better way to get started because you can focus on writing on the cookbooks and using Knife and getting used to Chef. And then once you feel more comfortable with that, you can go ahead and set up your own Chef server, right, when you get into production and you're, you're worried about that. But for development, it might be easier just to set up a, a, a hosted Chef account and just, you know. Um, at this point, I, th I think it's about two thirds using hosted. I mean, there's there's people out there using the Chef server, but we have more and more people every day moving to the the hosted Chef just because running the Chef server isn't really part of what you're trying to get done with Chef. Um, so, you know, and it is secure. Everything's run over HTTPS. It's encrypted. Um, you know, we talked about the key, how it's all done. We don't actually ever have a copy of. Uh, your private key so we couldn't get on your nodes. The Chef server never does any pushes out to the nodes. Everything's done pull. So when nodes check into the Chef server, they pull stuff down, you know. So um, it's very secure and we're, you know, we've got a couple, next week we're gonna have a big announcement. If, if you, for some reason, can't run your own, you don't wanna run the Chef server yourself, but you can't use our hosted product, we're gonna have alternatives for people. So we're gonna, Velocity next week, we'll make some announcements, so. Um, but. I don't know if a lot of that made sense. I mean, I hope, you know, I tried to zoom through a lot of things. Uh, you know, doing a Chef 101 mix with a deep dive can be difficult sometimes. So I don't know if, is there anything that people had other questions about? I mean, I can, anything, Chef, you know. The, uh, is the local data um, that is pulled for the client, mm -hmm. is, that, uh, is that kept around? Or is that yeah, so around? the cookbooks are cached down on the disk. I think it's out in, um, var cache chef and there's a cookbooks directory and everything's cached there. So if there, so if you've been working on a cookbook and you push that up to the chef server to make a change, the next time chef runs on one of the nodes, it's going to pull down those changes automatically. So, um, and the actual then execution of the chef client, it evaluates those cookbooks and does everything out on the local node. Um, so if you talk about how a chef run works, like when you actually invoke chef client, um, OHI actually goes out and, gra and gathers all that metadata about the node, um, and it sends that back up to the Chef server and saves it. And then the actual recipe code's evaluated and run, um, and then at the end of that, the state of the node's actually saved back up to the Chef server once more. And when I say state, it's all that attribute data. Um, so. Is any of that data, is there any chance that any of that data can be, like, say a database, username, password? Yeah. Um, they're actually, so a lot of that stuff you'd end up putting in like a data bag and you can actually encrypt the data bags. So we have something called encrypted data bags that allows you to actually, you know, it's almost like storing secure data in Dropbox. There's ways to do it, but you have to encrypt the data before you send it to the storage area. So we have this idea of an encrypted data bag that the keys are kept in the clear. So the actual thing like MySQL user, but the actual user value could be encrypted. Uh, and save. So there are, it's a little more difficult to do, um, but if, if you're in a, you know, you want to store some really sensitive data in your data bag, you can do it. Um, and we have ways to get around that, so. And one reason for starting up in Chef was because it uh, looks like you guys are going to start doing Windows plugins. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Um, how, how's that look as far as uh, enthusiasm and with It's huge. I mean, right now, like, so I was the primary author of all that code. Um, and they're really excited. There's a lot of people asking about it. Um, at this point, you can fully bootstrap and provision Windows nodes using uh, the SSH protocol or WinRM. So WinRM is sort of the Microsoft blessed way to do remote management now in Windows nodes. Um, and I also just wrote a PowerShell cookbook, which allows you to basically execute uh, and evaluate PowerShell code um, in the context of Chef. So, uh, next week, I'm going to be actually meeting with one of the VMware guys to go over talking about some other things for Windows, and I think we're going to be adding a couple other primitives, things like Windows package management, like, so there isn't really a package manager, but we want to make a nice way that you can install MSIs and install, you know, all those kind of things and manage those. Uh, so we're going to add some more Windows primitives, and then I think we're hoping to write a cookbook to do IIS installation and configuration and SQL Server. Really, so we could do a full quick start showing how to deploy a Windows stack. That's the goal for at least my team, you know. To, so, and what's, what's the on that? Um, like months, like yeah. weeks, like yeah, it's going to be this summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and some of that gets accelerated. So I, you know, I do all this with the open source project, but I'm also on the services team. So if a customer, we're working in a customer engagement where they want, they're paying us to do some of this work. 
it gets done quicker. So Knife Windows came out of a, a customer project where they, they wanted provisioning from Windows, so we got it done. Every time we work on a services engagement, we make sure there's language in there to say any of the code that we do will be open sourced and brought back to the community. So it's nice that every project we work on, we're able to bring that stuff right back. And so, but yeah, if, I mean, I'll give you a card and if you want to talk more about the Windows stuff, you can just shoot me an email or I'm always on IRC, so. But I've got stickers up here too, if you guys want any, so. Cool. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.